I'm Talia Schlanger. My guest this week is London-born, New York City-based musician, composer, and vocalist Danielle Eva Schwab. In this episode, Danielle tells the story of the final song from her band Delanila's 2020 album, Overloaded. Danielle co-produced the album with famed rock producer David Bottrell, most well-known for his work with bands like Tool, Muse, Smashing Pumpkins, and many more. The song is called It's Been a While Since I Went Outside. It was released during the 2020 pandemic lockdown, but the origins of the track and the lyrics date back long before most of us were spending quite so much time indoors. I'm Danielle Eva Schwab. I think I probably started working on most of these songs around 2016 or so. They came together really slowly over time, but a lot of them had actually been around in pieces before that. I had some scattered verses and I couldn't figure out what to do with those. And then I had some melodies and some kind of ideas for production. But it was really around 2016 that I started actually thinking about this project and working towards it seriously. I was living in New York. I had mono pretty badly when I was about 23, 24, and I was stuck inside for about six months then and basically was sick on and off for about two to three years afterwards where I would continually relapse. And I think this feeling of isolation, there's a lot of that experience in there, being at home and the TV being on and starting to feel like the characters that you see in the TV shows are more real than the people that you see in the real world. Cause the TV is on. Beginning to feel that this false world is real and I should stay inside. That's an experience that was kind of a running theme in my life for a little while. <laughs> I have a lot of lyrical ideas across songs that always come back to sleep. So while this track wasn't necessarily about having mono, I think that's just a word that's in my writing a lot because I was so tired for such a long time. And so I think the backdrop of that, combined with the fact that as a composer and a songwriter, so much of what you do is spending time by yourself, really putting in your 10,000 hours and honing your craft, I was pretty isolated. And I think this song really grew out of that feeling. It started off on the piano. This one was chords and melody. I think I had the verses and the pre-choruses. And then I kind of set them aside for a long time because I didn't have any idea what I was going to do with the chorus of it. Everything I came up with initially really felt very flat. It was all kind of in the same key and it didn't feel like it had enough of a lift. And for a long time, I just wasn't even sure if it was really a song. I kind of had just a feeling of stillness and strangeness. And so those verses and those pre-choruses, they kind of just sat around for a long time. I think by the time I'd started working with my co-producer, David Bottrell, I had an idea for the chorus, which was pretty out there. And then I think when I played it to David, he's so used to hearing through the bells and whistles of production to really what just the skeleton of the songwriting is. He was just like, no, this is awesome. This totally works. Like, yes, it's a little weird. Like, your chord progression is wrong by a... Uh, all definitions of music theory. It's an F-sharp minor to a C major, and that shouldn't sound good, but it also works. This is not the kind of harmonic progression that you would teach a student in music school to write. It doesn't sound like it should work, but it kind of does. One of the things I loved about working with David is that the devil is in the details, and we both very much see music making that way. And he was very game to kind of just go down the rabbit hole with me and try things and shape the arrangements with nuance and attention to detail and just really go into the weeds. He just really encouraged me to go with what felt right rather than what was right by the kind of textbook definition of things versus what feels good to you when you actually sit down at a piano and play through it. I think I demoed this one pretty extensively in my home studio. And then I worked on it some more with a friend over in London who at the time was working at Abbey Road, Pierce McIntyre, just really sitting in a room together, kind of bouncing ideas back and forth. But at that point, 
it didn't feel rocky enough. So we definitely fleshed out the kind of structure and bones of the song that way, but it just felt to me like it needed to be bigger. I had thought of the Delanila project as very much a band kind of thing. It just seemed to me like it needed bigger guitars and some strings, and the song was big enough that it could support something that felt a little bit more grand and more kind of epic. So I brought all of that back to New York, and then I put the band together, and we got everyone into a studio. We tracked the record in two halves, primarily at the Bunker Studio in Brooklyn. Aaron Steele played drums on this. He plays with Portugal the Man and many wonderful people. He's just a really wonderful drummer. David gets great sounds for everything, but particularly drum sounds and guitar sounds. Ruben Kaner played bass. It's Ruben's acoustic bass, and then he also has a MIDI synth bass. I remember sitting in the studio and everyone just trying to make the biggest sound that they could possibly make. Pierce McIntyre created this amazing piano sound, which is a filtered, lo-fi, heavily affected piano. It's actually me playing the part, but the sound is all Pierce. I believe it's just really a, like a soft synth patch. It is a really good sound. So when I wrote this song, it was written on piano, which is weird for me because I'm primarily a guitarist. And I think the guitar part really just came from the way that I was articulating it on the piano initially, which was just very simple arpeggiated chords, because that's kind of my <laughs> my limit as a, as a piano player. And then it was just translated to the guitar that way. It, it felt like it would work better on a guitar. I know that we had two amps running simultaneously in the studio. I think that was really just everyone trying to do their best Radiohead impression. David gets magic guitar sounds. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to work with him. I grew up playing in bands and listening to band music, and even though this record has a lot of different elements in it, it just really needed someone who came from that background and could infuse that kind of sensibility into the music. There were a lot of guitars here that I think were demoed either in my place in New York or in London, where they were just supposed to be kind of placeholder sounds that we would replace later, but then even though some of them were kind of trashy, when we actually got into the room and sat down and tried to kind of replicate them and make them sound quote unquote better, we realized that the dodgy ones were so good. Something that we really spent time finessing with this track was just how to have it build so that you're really telling a story and having the sounds kind of develop and take a listener somewhere. But with this one, I think because the choruses have the potential to sound so big, we really just wanted to make sure that we were structuring the development of the arrangement in a way that the kind of climactic last chorus would really feel earned. I think initially we had like huge guitars on every single chorus. And then when we went through in the edit and the mix, we muted a lot and tried to be discerning and thoughtful as to where we were putting the biggest sounds. The first chorus, relative to the last one, it's pretty small. and then they kind of just grow one by one until the last chorus, which is like the kitchen sink of what we recorded, really. Nick Semrad played synths. Nick is a fantastic keyboard player who I have known for a pretty long time. When I first started putting together my band and uh, playing shows around New York, Nick played in that. And then when it came time to do the sessions, it was really just kind of a no-brainer. He's such a creative player. I know he runs a lot of his keyboards through guitar pedals, which was great fun. He's definitely not someone who falls back on presets which is, I think, why a lot of the sounds are pretty unique. 
He's just kind of a weird, freaky, all-around musical genius. I did all the string arranging, and then Julian Crowhurst did the copy work for the string arrangements. Those were done at Bunker in Brooklyn. I think we had a room of 12 people, and then they were doubled. Around the time when we were leading up to the recording sessions, I did bring in Greg Pliska, who's an orchestrator that I've been working with for quite a while, who's actually someone who got me some of my first jobs in the industry. This was such a big project, and there were so many moving parts that it got to the point where I was like, all right, I'm just not going to be able to finish all of this myself. And so I think I handed Greg a sort of half-finished arrangement and was like, go, do whatever you'd like. There are certainly like a few embellishments that he added. It was really collaborative, which was nice. As a songwriter, as a composer, I think you have to articulate your ideas clearly enough that people know what to do with them. But it's also a good thing to kind of leave a little bit of space for them to do their thing as well, especially when you're working with really, really talented people. At the very end of the song, there's a really beautiful moment with the strings, which is something that Greg Pliska came up with. I think we actually extended the song arrangement just because those string parts were so cool before it just ended with a big guitar chord and Greg took the initiative and, and ran with it and I'm very glad that he did. I trust Greg so much as an orchestrator because we've worked together so many times and I know his work so well that I was just like, if there's space for stuff, you're welcome to add things. And that was one of those wonderful surprises where I was like, ugh, this is just so good and so weird, but so right. It's one of my favorite string moments on the record. I did all the singing. It's been a while since I went outside. This track, I think some of them were done in my living room in New York and the others were done in David's living room. I have a, an inherited trick from David. He makes what we have affectionately dubbed the throat stripper tea. It's decaffeinated black tea with lemon juice and honey served as hot as you can tolerate it, and it clears everything out. So yeah, it was a lot of vocal warm-ups and throat stripper, <laughs> basically. So, you know, everyone else got the fancy studio, and then this the vocals were all at home, which I actually think was nice. I mean, doing vocals is such a kind of intimate, quiet thing in some ways, even if you're singing loudly. It's nice to be somewhere where you can kind of just, like, chill out in a kitchen and sit on a couch and be comfy. The backing vocals, the lyrics are fairly sparse in the chorus, and so it just felt natural to put a backing vocal in there. It's not really right to call it a call and response, but they're more important than just backing vocals, I think. Hold on while I go. Hold they feel like part of the melody to me and like they're quite present. From this dark hole of doubt. I think we were just thinking about Freddie Mercury Queen kind of vibes there. It just felt sort of suitably operatic and melodramatic. David and I discovered that we both kind of had an affinity for like weird vocal harmonies. We could have just kept making those and never stopped. David wound up mixing it. Given how dense the arrangements were, it just needed to be someone who knew all of the kind of little bells and whistles and twists and turns and deep dark corners of the arrangements. But also I just loved his mixes. He's a fantastic mix engineer, really one of the best of all time in my book. He's able to make these like really dense productions sound natural. That's not something that everyone can do. So when all was said and done, we had a finished record. We sent it off to Emily Lazar, who mastered it, and then this song was released at the very end of April 2020. So really while everything was still in chaos and disarray in New York. I was in Manhattan 
for the worst of the peak of the early days of the pandemic, you know, March, April, May of 2020. And the city was completely deserted. It was very surreal living down there, very sad. And I just remember feeling like I wanted to do something to document it. And so the video for this track wound up being what we called a visual poem, which was just a compilation of what I was thinking of as moving photographs of the city. So videos that I shot in super slow motion of the empty streets and then cut together. It really affected me seeing the city that empty every day. And I just thought, you know, I have this track that like weirdly speaks to the feeling of the moment. I had a song and I had a phone and I thought I could just show people really what it felt like being stuck down there. It still feels very strange to me that the experience that I'd had a year, two years prior, wound up being everyone's experience, and I just kind of happened to have a track that spoke to that. And now, here's It's Been a While Since I Went Outside. Since I 